After Allied forces defeated Germany in World War II, Nazi officers, high-ranking party members, and collaborators continue to exist in a long, strange twilight. Some escaped to South America in so-called rat lines. Others dissolved into society and did their best to move on. And still others built up massive wealth as part of Germany's richest business dynasties, even though it was an open secret that their wealth was built upon war profiteering, whether by claiming abandoned Jewish property or using Jews during wartime as essentially slave labor. Today's guest is David de Jong, and he's the author of the book Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties. He describes how German tycoon families seized Jewish businesses, procured slave laborers, and ramped up weapons production to equip Hitler's army as Europe burned around them. These brutal legacies dominate Daimler-Benz and still control Porsche, Volkswagen, and BMW. But the story is more complicated than that. As de Jong notes, the U.S. had a role in pardoning Nazi collaborators and for the most part turned a blind eye to these war crimes, especially as it relied on German industry to ramp up in the early stages of the Cold War, particularly in the Korean War. And that's to say nothing of such operations as Operation Paperclip, in which the German rocket scientist who developed the V-2 rocket program, which rained down these weapons on London, was the foundation of the Apollo moon missions. So this discussion is an exploration between politics and big business and what it means to openly and honestly reckon with your past. Hope you enjoy this discussion with David DeJong. When I think of people enriching themselves in World War II, I imagine war profiteering of Nazis hoarding gold stolen from their victims, literal tons of it. Or I think of German industries guilty of war profiteering, using Jews as slave labor. But you argue that there's much more about the story that is either untold or has been hiding in plain sight and not called out. So what fact or story first clued you into this larger issue and led you to research and write your book? It was actually the summer of 2012 when I first discovered this family office. It was called, uh, it, well, it's still around. It's called the Harold Quant Family Office. It's in Bad Homburg, which is a spa town uh, north of Frankfurt. And they had a very kind of obscure website, um, with like one page website, which just said that they managed 18 billion in assets and not only for themselves, but also for other families. And I started looking into them and it turns out that Harold Quant was the only surviving son of Magda Goebbels and that he was the son from her first marriage to Günther Quant, who was the industrialist and the patriarch to the family which today controls BMW. And they, Günther and Magda divorced, and they had one son, Harold, and, and Magda ended up marrying Joseph Goebbels. They had six children. Of course, she murdered her six children in the Führer bunker on April 29th, 1945, and then committed suicide, like murder-suicide with her husband in the Chancery Garden. And Harold survived all of this. He was a prisoner of war at that point in Benghazi, actually held by the, by, in a, in a British prisoner of war camp. And it was, you know, it was in 1954, Gunter Quant dies and he, he splits up his empire between his two sons, Herbert Quant and Harold Quant. Herbert ends up saving BMW from bankruptcy and his two youngest children are today control BMW. And now their cousins are the ones their four cousins are the ones who descend from Harald Quant, and they have this family office in Bad Homburg. But it was this this story about you know in in, in it was a story about how Günther Quant, who owned a battery company called Afa and a weapons company called uh, DVM, that he was actually one of the you know largest profiteers and one of the main industrialists in the Third Reich by, you know, supplying batteries for, for submarines and rockets, as well as, you know, being one of the largest arms producers. He used an estimated 50,000, like almost 60,000 forced and slave laborers in his, in his factories, including concentration camp, you know, men that were held captive in concentration camps and women too. And he also stole companies from Germans who were Jewish or acquired companies far under the, you know, nominal market value of these companies, of these people who were put under massive pressure to sell their companies. 
So it was it was that it was actually that the Harold Quant hold the family office, which which kind of clued me into this larger, in, you know, pretty crazy story about Günter Quant's relationship with Magda Goebbels, you know, their descendants, and and also his profiteering during the Third Reich. Well, a lot of what books try to do is debunk popular myths, and I consider myself a person with common knowledge about Nazi war profiteering, as I mentioned at the top of our discussion, that I know bits and pieces about it. As you mentioned, the use of slave labor in factories. What uh, I suppose we should first discuss common knowledge about Nazi war profiteering. What would an average person think when they're asked how the Nazis enriched themselves during World War II? And how would you say that this common knowledge is perhaps accurate, but it's you can tell that it's missing the larger picture? I mean, it's it's I mean, when you talk about Nazi, I mean, I guess it's, we're talking about, are we talking about, you know, I feel, I guess the first popular myth to debunk, you know, when you talk about Nazis, so profiteering, we're talking about, are we talking about people, Germans who were members of the NSAP, you know, the Nazi party, or are we talking about the Nazi top cadre, you know, like the high ranking officials in the party who enriched themselves? I think, you know, once Hitler seized power in, in, in January 1933, the, the laws that came, that, that came into, you know, the laws that were codified and that cemented, you know, laws against, you know, anti-Semitic laws, laws against Jews or laws that disenfranchised, disenfranchised Jews and others, it was, you know, at this point that, that enabled German businessmen, I mean, they were, you know, exclusively all men, we can say, to initiate to Aryanize, as it was called, assets, and that meant that you know you they could they could buy you know companies on the you know for a very low price because the owners the Jewish owners were put under so much pressure that they were forced to sell their businesses or their or their land or their houses or their or their you know or their art or their jewelry and that that really came into effect. I mean. Germans from with from you know with a Jewish background already started being fired from like executive boards and supervisory boards from 1933-1934. But it wasn't until 1935, where the Nuremberg Grace Laws came into effect, that really you see this wave of Aryanizations. You know, which an Aryanizations means to remove kind of or to remove the Jewish element from an asset. You know, this wave of Aryanizations hitting engulfing Germany. Because well, uh, Jews were desperate to leave to leave Germany, and German businessmen saw an opportunity to seize assets on the on unfortunately on 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 the cheap. You know, they saw they saw yeah they saw a a brutal buying opportunity. So that is one aspect of profiteering. You know, of course, there's the massive rearmament that happens after Hitler seizes power. He he initiates against the Treaty of Versailles. He initiates rearmament for Germany. Uh, he first does it in secret, and then he goes public with it in 1935. And that, of course, revives a starved German industry, which has been, you know, which has been burdened by 15 years of the Versailles Treaty and not being able to produce arms, being very limited in what they can do, what they could do in industry, industry-wise. And that, of course, you know, that that wave lasts for well, I think by 1943, at that, that kind of the peak of Nazi Germany's power, it kind of levels off. So that is the second aspect of profiting. And of the third, and that's a very, it's a very tricky subject, is the use of, of whether the use of forced and slave labor actually can be considered profiteering in the sense that did they actually benefit from using people that were enslaved? I mean, they benefited from it, but but did they actually did did these did these men actually profit from you know or, or how to calculate that? It's a very it's it's very it's very difficult to calculate whether whether this was actually a a, a cost benefit for for the company to use people who were you know abused, held captive, underfed, you know, to use them in in, in factories and mines, you know, under the most horrible circumstances generally. So these are these these you know the, the the popular myths that are out there on on kind of you know Nazi, which are, which generally it goes back to like art you know the mass art looting which of course happened and 
as well as the, the the asset seizing that you know it's i would say or or like hugo boss producing producing the uniforms you know that's always one, one of the things that people ask you know about the book is it a, is it is hugo boss f- featuring in it hugo hugo boss was was a minor was a minor player when compared to to the families that i'm writing about so yeah in particular you mentioned Germany's uh, most important business dynasties who are involved in this. Which ones are they, and how do they, you know, exploit abandoned Jewish assets or make use of this free labor as you described? What were you able to find? So there's five main. There's the five main dynasties uh, in my book, and the main one is well, actually, the central one is is the Quant family, which today one branch. Uh, two members of, of of one branch of the family today control BMW. Uh, they own about forty seven percent of the stock. And as I mentioned earlier, it's it's their grandfather Günther Quant, who was married to Magda Goebbels from nineteen twenty one to nineteen thirty, and who had the the battery company called AFA and this weapons weapons company called the the DVM. And he used mass and for he used you know forced the mass slave mass slave labor on a particularly big scale in his factories and estimated almost sixty thousand during the war and then there is you know he stole he you know acquired Jewish companies far under a market value between nineteen thirty six I believe was the first company and that ended somewhere midway during the war 42 43 that is his his final attempts to acquire either you know either companies owned by jews but also companies owned uh, companies that were seized in nazi occupied territories by french people by by french or by uh, danish or danes or polish um thirdly i mean he and and so his so that's the main that's the their key to the book they're like they're they're the center the red line that are the red thread of, of the book secondly there's friedrich flick as the flick dynasty which controlled which until 1985 were the controlling shareholders of, of daimler benz and but during the war friedrich flick had a massive steel coal and machinery conglomerate one of the largest in in nazi germany and he was, he was actually convicted, he ended up, he, he's the one tycoon in my book who actually ends up being convicted at Nuremberg because the rest all, well, gets off with a slap on the wrist. And he, in his massive conglomerate, which was named after himself, uh, Flick uh, used tens of thousands of forced and slave laborers and also was probably the largest profiteer of Aryanizations, of, of, of seizing, of, of acquiring Jewish assets far under uh, Jewish owned assets far under the um, under market value or even you know for like really a pittance and was also one of the largest uh, weapons producers it was also one of the largest arms producers of, of of Nazi Germany ended up being that because his main for his first he retooled from steel and coal or he retooled his steel factories um, for use in, in in arms factories thirdly there's the von Fink Dynasty. August von Fink Senior was the was the largest shareholder and the and the supervisory board chairman of of Allianz in Munich Re. His father Wilhelm von Fink had actually co-founded Allianz and Munich Re, which are you know then and now two of the largest insurers reinsurers on the planet. Um, and he also founded a a private bank called Merck, Merck Fink, which is also still around. And he was asked by Hitler in 1933, so I was from Fink Jr. was, um, because he inherited everything from his father uh, after his father died in 1924, including the board positions. He was asked by Hitler to, if he could fundraise for a new museum that he wanted to, that he wanted to have in Munich called the Museum of, of, of German Art, or the House, the House of German Art, actually. And it's a, it's a it's a beautiful museum. It's actually still around. It's not called the House of German Art anymore. It's called the House of Art. And he successfully fundraised for the first tranche. I think it was eight million Reichsmark, but he ended up fundraising about twenty million from fellow tycoons, from fellow industrialists, from fellow financiers. So, and after the museum opened in nineteen thirty seven, you know, he was kind of rewarded by the by the Nazi regime 
for his fundraising efforts, and he got to Ari. He he, he went on Arianizing a branch of the Dreyfus Bank in Berlin, a, a private bank to expand his own private bank, Merck Fink, and the Rothschild Bank in Vienna a branch. Of, you know, the, the Rothschild Bank in 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 Austria actually it was the the Austrian branch of the Rothschilds. And then f- uh, fourthly, there is the Porsche Piech family, and they today control the, the Volkswagen Group, the largest car manufacturer in the world, which owns brands such as well, Volkswagen, obviously, but their own brand, Porsche, and then also Lamborghini, Bentley, Audi. And they were actually on the verge of bankruptcy when, when Hitler seized power. Uh, Ferdinand Porsche had, had founded his, his own car design firm together with his son-in-law, Anton Pierre, and a, their, other, their third co-founder, Adolf Rosenberger, who was Jewish. And they, and he was, Rosenberger was the financial backer. Now, of course, Ferdinand Porsche ends up designing, selling Hitler on the idea of, of, of designing the Volkswagen for Hitler. And in 1935, Porsche and, uh, Ferdinand Porsche and Anton Pierre buy out or Aryanize Adolf Rosenberger's stake of, uh, out of Porsche, his 10% stake for the exact nominal value that he was bought in, that he was, that he, that he bought in. In 1930, when when the company was founded, so even though profits had had risen massively, so he wasn't, you know, he wasn't. It was an aryanization because he was paid far under under market value for 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 his shares. And of course, the 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 Ferdinand Porsche and Anton Pierre ended up leading the the Volkswagen factory, this this, this massive factory in in, in, the, in the center of Germany, which is actually still around today, and there. Which was all backed by the state, which is all backed by by the regime and funded by the regime by the German Labor Fund, and where they use where they mass produce weapons and they use tens of thousands of forced and slave laborers and actually have have sub concentration camps on the uh, like forced labor camps and and concentration camps or sub concentration camps as they were called or satellite camps on the uh, grounds of the Volkswagen factory, and lastly it's the it's the Utker family it's the Utker dynasty which have a massive baking goods firm, a conglomerate today. Actually, it's, it's far more diversified than just baking goods now. It's, it's luxury hotels, it's, it's champagne, it's, 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 it's alcohol, it's yeah, frozen pizzas. It's, uh, yeah, it's a whole range of, of assets. They have two separate conglomerates these days. And they are mainly an example. They were small in comparison to, to the other families I'm writing about. But they... Rudolf August Utker, which is the man who, who built the conglomerate out after the war, had a stepfather who, who led the who led Doctor Utker during the Third Reich. Uh, his name was Richard Kazalowski, and he was a he was a convinced he was an ideological Nazi. He would hand out a Mein Kampf to new employees, and he also joined this together with Friedrich Flick joined this group called the Himmler Circle of Friends, which ended up funding you know. Some of Himmler's, Himmler, of course, being the architect of the Holocaust. Some of Himmler's more esoteric hobbies and 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 money also went to to SS units um, and such. And he he so he was an ideologue and ran this company. And his his stepson, who is grooming to be CEO, Rudolf August Utker, ends up joining or ends up applying and and being admitted to the Waffen SS. Um, and Doctor Utker also. Did all these joint ventures together with the the Wehrmacht, the German Army, and and, and the SS to like food food joint ventures, and they also they had subsidiaries who produced weapons, and also had in the joint joint ventures they had forced and slave laborers also deployed, and also in some of their subsidiaries. It's yeah, and it and and of course, but most prominently, Rudolf August Utker ends up joining the SS. And then has to take over the company when his mother and his stepfather and his two two brother, uh, two sisters, half sisters, are killed by a bomb in 1944 on their house in Bielefeld in Western Germany. But you know was still very much ideologically aligned, or was certainly a far right supporter. Also, still you know after the war fell. So those are the five. Those are the five dynasties. And yeah, that's their that's their story. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. But first, I want to give a shout out to all the other great shows on the Parthenon Podcast Network, including Beyond the Big Screen, 
And you can find this and many other great shows at ParthenonPodcast.com. We'll come back to the wartime profiteering experience in the United States because you notice the German-U.S. connections here during and especially after the war. But briefly, I want to focus on um, what happens to these companies immediately after the war because it would be something of an open secret on how they would have profiteered, I would imagine, in German society. Was Germany itself, was the idea that, well, Nazism was so widespread in our nation that except for those accused of crimes at Nuremberg, Everyone else simply needs to pick up and move on and rebuild, leading to the German economic miracle in the 1950s. And it seems like the globe all over is willing to embrace German consumer products by the 1950s with the popularity of Volkswagens in the United States. But do these companies simply agree to stay silent about the matters during the war and move on after the war? Or is there some process of reconciling what they did during the war? I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't, not directly after the war, there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't also kind of a, a unanimous decision to, it was more, it was more society wide. It was, you know, millions, tens of millions of people had supported the, the Nazi party, had become, well, millions had become members. Many had shared in the atrocities of the Nazi regime. So it wasn't only, it wasn't companies as much that, 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 wanted to keep their that wanted to keep their crimes, you know, wanted to to brush their crimes under the, you know, under the rug. But it was just general that they wanted to that they they wanted to move on, they wanted to forget what what had happened. It was it was something they yeah, they wanted to forget about. And they didn't want to talk about it. And then of course they also wanted to get away with their their crimes. They hoped that the, the Allied occupiers wouldn't find out what they had done to their to, to their fellow citizens or to yeah or well and, and to the rest of to the rest of Europe there was a lot of of course there was a mass documentation that was seized by by the allied um by the americans particularly um and of course you know there were some there, i mean there were some ways of 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 kind of of reckoning with legal ways i mean it's very bizarre now today to hear vladimir putin talk about denazification of you, of, of ukraine because denazification is actually a very specific term that was introduced in the Potsdam at the Potsdam conference in August 1945, which was one of the four Ds that Stalin uh, claimed at least a new a British Prime Minister who succeeded who succeeded Winston Churchill, and American President Harry Truman agreed upon, and it was denazification turned out to be a very flawed process that was handed over to the Germans. And which were legal proceedings, uh, the United States were legal proceedings that the, that Germans had to go through if they were accused of complicity of Nazi crime, of, of, of Nazi sympathies or crimes related to the regime. And they, and it was, you know, it was, of course, no, but no German wanted to, you know, well, most Germans didn't feel particularly inclined to to judge their fellow compatriots in crimes that they had themselves taken part in. Most of the, these denazification courts or tribunals or, or panels is a, is a better word, actually. You know, were laymen, were lay judges and lay prosecutors, and you know, most people, many people who, who committed the most horrific crimes were. You know, you you could be put into five categories you could be ruled into five categories and most were you know in the exonerated or in the in the fellow traveler category and not in the major offender or or offender category so you know that was one way of a flawed way of, of reckoning and of course there were there were the nuremberg trials you know the, the main trial which of course um saw 24 of the top political and military officers put to trial, which is the most famous Nuremberg trial. But then there were nine successor trials that was uh, allied organized, but then there were the, the, pardon, the 12 successor trials organized under the purview of the United States. And Friedrich Flick, one of the main characters in the book, is indicted and sentenced. And, and, and so are four of his fellow managers are indicted and sentenced in, in one of the trials, the Flick trial, as was Alfred Krupp, of, of the Krupp conglomerate and his, and, and his managers and IG Farben, the, the mass conglomerate, the mass chemicals conglomerate, which 
wasn't owned by a family, which was which was the largest chemical company in in the world at that point. At that point, um, but had you know its entire executive board was was indicted and, and sentenced at Nuremberg. But in 1950, you know, for those who in, in 1950, uh, John J. McCloy became the uh, High Commissioner for Occupied Germany and commuted most of the sentences of those convicted at Nuremberg, both you know, industrialists like Friedrich Flick and, and, and Alfred Krupp, but also those of, of, of high-ranking SS officers who, you know, had slaughtered tens of thousands, if not hundreds of, if not a hundred thousand of people, mainly Jews in Eastern Europe as part of the so-called the Einsatzgruppe. And they were sentenced to death, but they, he, but he, he, he could, he commuted them to, to life sentences. And then they were, then they ended up being quite swiftly released in, 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 in the course of the 1950s. So yeah, it was, um, it was a flawed reckoning. I mean, that that's, and it, it didn't, and it, that didn't change until 19, until 1968 with the big student protests. And that that's when a, and with the red army faction, I mean, it, that was the period in Germany when, when a reckoning started, when a change started to come about, when the, post-war generation came of age and started to ask hard questions to their parents and grandparents about what they did during the war. And, um, and that was, uh, you know, it, and, and with the Eichmann trial too, I mean, these are, these are main, these are, which of course put the Holocaust uh, they, they front and center, which also wasn't, you know, which also didn't get any uh, attention, you know, the, the, the murder of, of, of more than 6 million Jews. I mean, it's it's incredible, but it was it was not a topic that people spoke about. Victims obviously were being incredibly traumatized, and well, perpetrators, of course, not not willing to talk about their crimes. The question of reckoning is a challenging one, especially when it affects most of, if not the majority, of a nation. And yeah. one may say, pragmatically, how can we move on except to provide a wide scale amnesty, except for the very worst offenders, similar to amnesty provided to Confederates in the American Civil War. But the other part of the story, I mean, that you really focus on is the U.S. role in pardoning Nazi collaborators and even, you could say, collaboration during the war. Can you describe what that means? The The best example I know is Operation Paperclip, and that's part of it, yeah. but it goes further than that. So can you describe what you wrote about? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, as I just, I mean, it was, the change came about when I mean, first there was this plan by Morgan, the Morgenthau plan, which uh, called basically for summer uh, for a dismantling German industry. It was in, in I think it was, the Morgenthau plan was in 1944, so the war was still going on, which basically called for the dismantling of German industry and the summarily execution of basically all top Nazis or industrialists. Then John J. McCloy, who later ends up coming, it's him and it's, it's Secretary of War, I think it's Cordell Hill or Stimson, his, his name eludes me. They create kind of the, the, the occupation plan for Germany, which envisions the, the Nuremberg trials and as well as, you know, denazification, um, as well as the, the occupying, the, the kind of the dividing of, of occupied Germany between, you know, the American zone, the British zone, the French zone, and at that point still the Soviet zone, which was still part of the, the, the negotiations at that point. And when, you know, when McCloy comes back in 1950, as when he gets appointed as, as, as high commissioner uh, of occupied Germany, you know, he decides, and it's basic, I mean, the Korean War has just began and they need Western, they need West German industry to provide, well, they need West Germany as a partner to provide a bull, and, and the Cold War started, you know, they, they, they need West Germany as a bulwark, a democratic West Germany under Chancellor Konrad Adenauer as a bulwark against communism. It's a key, it's a key partner. I mean, Germany, and it is, still is today, and it was then, is the economic heart of Europe, the third largest economy in the world by GDP. It's a, it's a machine. So you need it, the US needed West Germany as a viable political partner in the in the Cold War as a bulwark, of course, you know, Soviets having having occupied East Germany, East Berlin as a, as a capital, which ended up being you know the satellite state of of the Soviet Union with East, East Berlin as its capital, East Germany, and the Americans want. I guess at that point, it's Eisenhower has just taken office, 
No, it's still the last years of Truman, actually. And they, yeah, so they, they, they have, so they want West Germany as a, as a, as a political ally, as a, or as kind of a, a, the bulwark against communism, but they also need Germany's industrial prowess to generate goods, to, to manufacture goods. Because with the Korean War, there comes this kind of bottleneck where this decree comes where, you know, most American factories produce, start producing arms for the war. And West Germany fills as, as a key industrialized nation in the West, fills that gap and starts producing the goods that the U.S. isn't focusing on as much or, or as, as this bottleneck because of their arms production. So in the end, so, so McCloy makes this political decision, basically, where he's commuting all these sentences for the industrial, the, you know, he shortens the, the sentences for the, for the German industrialists. And he does also does the same for the, for, you know, the high ranking SS officers who slaughtered thousands. Um, he commutes their death sentences and, and they are then shortly after they're released. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it was a political decision. It, it was a political decision similar to Operation Paperclip in the sense that, well, with Operation Paperclip, they just want, they wanted the knowledge that these scientists had. Here, they wanted the, I mean, it was a, poli- a political expedient decision. They wanted the, they wanted Germany's power by their side. They knew wanted West Germany as an ally. And uh, yeah, that was the political decision they made, the U.S. made. Hey, everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, I'm curious, you've mentioned that these business dynasties that dominate Daimler-Benz, Allianz, they still control Porsche, Volkswagen, and BMW. Has there been any sort of reckoning over the decades from where their initial seed capital or wealth came from, or has it been a polite silence among them and then society toward them, or has have many people mostly forgotten? How has this been dealt with? No, it's still, I mean, it's still a big topic in, in, in Germany. Well, it's still a, a big topic globally. What they do in Germany is that they commission, it's, it's, there's this kind of this tried and true playbook that they all use, that most of them use, that most German business owners use. When news, when, you know, the media comes out with a story on their, you know, the, the, the dark Nazi past of their patriarchs. So they, Commission. What they always do is they, they commission a, a a historian to to figure it all, to initiate a, a research, independent research, in, and do archival research uh, across Europe and the U.S. And then come out four years later with a book that says, "Well, you know, uh, Günter Quant did, you know, had uh, X amount of slave labor, forced slave laborers working for him, and you know, he stole these and these companies, and he produced X amount of of weapons. But it's you know, it's done in a you know, it's the research is. I mean, the, these books always come out in Germany. The 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 inter, in German are written in German. The interests of these the business interests of these families, however, are global. So it's kind of these stories are. You know, thus far they're hidden in plain sight, and which allows BMW, for example, to have a foundation named after Herbert Quant, which has the perverse slogan "Inspire Responsible Leadership," because he saved BMW from bankruptcy in 1960. However, he also led a concentration camp. Oh, sorry, he also planned, built, and dismantled a subconcentration camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. He had the responsibility over a factory with 500 female slave laborers from concentration camps. The factory was in Berlin, and then he acquired companies seized, you know, seized by, seized from Jews in France. So, you know, there's still kind of this continuing whitewashing going on through global philanthropy. Of, uh, uh, of, I mean, in, to inspire responsible leadership is to be transparent, and that's what the book is about. In the end, it's an it's an argument in favor of historical transparency is to be transparent about, you know, the good things that Herbert Quant did, which was, I guess, good, you know, in the sense that it was, that it helped the economy, that he saved BMW, but also the, the, the horrific things that he did, which were, which were the crimes he committed during the Third Reich. And there, so there's these, this whitewashing going on of these people, of, of the names of, you know, major German industrialists today. 
you know, another example is Porsche, you know, Ferry Porsche, who was the one who ended up receiving the, the shares by Adolf Rosenberger. You know, he applied for the SS in 1938. He was admitted to the SS in 1941 as an, also, as an officer. He never served. He surrounded himself in the 1950s and 60s uh, as uh, executives at Porsche, many of whom had been SS members and who were the, you know, who were the most, some of them who had been sentenced to death and whose death sentence had been commuted or had done other most horrific crimes. And in the 1970s, Ferry Porsche publishes his first autobiography, We at Porsche, where he virulently you know, has like virulent anti-Semitic screeds against the Porsche co-founder Adolf, Adolf Rosenberger. And Ferry Porsche, you know, designed the first Porsche car in, in, in a sports car in 1948. And now there's a foundation named after Ferry Porsche about what a, what a, what a social, because to, to, you know, because he was such a social guy, you know, because he cared so much about social commitments, you know, so that is, it's like, it's, it's corporate whitewashing, you know, if you want to be, if you want to truly reckon with these horrendous crimes and be transparent about what these men did, and because else it is, you know, it clearly shows that business success trumps uh, trumps morality, you know, and and that's not the way it should be. This opens up a very interesting universal question of how do we reconcile with the past? To give way of example, I my research area was the Ottoman Empire in modern Turkey, and. Yeah. Many of the wealthy business families in Turkey, some of them can trace their wealth back to the period following the Armenian genocide, when many properties and assets were abandoned and reclaimed by others around them, or even in the 1980s in Turkey, when properties in the southeast were abandoned by ethnic Assyrian Christians. And today there are legal battles about different Assyrian Christians trying to get this property back. And less people think I'm beating up on Turkey, they were receiving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of mu Muslim refugees who themselves had their property confiscated by Imperial Russia or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In the United States, there are questions about companies such as like tobacco companies or textile companies that use tobacco and cotton, and their wealth was created by sharecroppers in the Jim Crow South, exploited black people, or some are even wondering if there are American companies whose wealth can be traced back to the antebellum period by slavery. And that gets a little bit murky over a longer period of time. But the point being that you can see this is a universal question of how do we reckon with the past, where on the one hand, sometimes horrible crimes can be swept under the rug. An American NATO officer might think, well, yes, Germany did terrible things, but we have to fight the Cold War. We need their industrial base. Or a NASA executive would think, well, Nazism is bad, but we need Werner von Braun and his knowledge of the V-2 rocket to beat the Soviets in the space race. So, you know, for the greater good, we're just going to overlook all that. So how do we balance being willfully blind to terrible crimes? And on the other hand, over a far enough period of past, you could find anyone who is complicit in something awful. So what do you think is a healthy reckoning with our past? I think a healthy reckoning is, is, is transparency, is radical transparency, is being is acknowledging the past. So on your website or on, you know, in corporate headquarters named after the, I find renaming always quite problematic as well because it hides the past again, right? It's about transparency. And to, if you want to name, you know, a, you know, a foundation or a media prize or a corporate headquarters after somebody who committed crimes in the Third Reich or who was an SS officer, then you have to say it, and, 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 but he also founded, uh, he also designed the first sport, uh, uh, Porsche sports car, or he, you know, he saved BMW. He, you have to name both. You know, that's how people learn from history is by being fully transparent about what these men did, both good and bad. Well, it's a very complicated question, but you've provided excellent material for us to ponder this and then specify it to a particular place in time and understand how we're still dealing with the fallout of World War II. So complicated questions, but you've given us a lot to ponder here. And for listeners who want to dive into the story in considerably more detail, the name of David's book is Nazi Billionaires, The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Scott. That's all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes with sources, maps, links, anything else related to this episode, and all my other ones as well, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. 
That's the name of the podcast network this show is a part of, along with James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other great history shows as well. If you'd like to support this show, the two easiest ways to do so are to subscribe to it on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second thing is to join the membership program for History Unplugged. If you do so, you'll get completely ad-free episodes for the entire back catalog, which is about 600 episodes and growing. 